Welcome back to the Norse Files. It is difficult to define one's own culture. When we look at a society that is vastly different from our own, it is easy to pick out those differences. But introspection requires a finer toothed comb. It is a challenge to take an objective look at our own lives, or to speculate without bias on our own customs. Perhaps one of the best tools we have for analysing our own culture is entertainment. Our media reflects our ideas and opinions, our ideals and our priorities. Ordinarily, our show deals with history, intrigue, and occasionally dragons. But tonight, we're going to take a special look at one aspect of our own culture in comparison to ancient Norse culture. A look at women, their portrayal versus reality, and how both of these have shifted as the years have passed. What did the Norse tales we know and love tell us about the women of the time? How much of it rang true? And how much of our own reality comes to life in the mediums that will outlast us? Magazines, films, Tumblr blogs. Join us as we take a deep and introspective journey tonight on The Norse Files. Ladies, have you ever felt that you were missing that special something? Have you ever longed to feel beautiful? Beautiful enough to catch the eye of that special someone? Has your magic spell or sleeping needle failed to ensnare the one you love? Then you should visit Advari's Jewelry Parlor because your man deserves for you to look the way you think you should for him. And if that fails, for every not cursed ring you purchase, we throw in a cursed one for free. That's the Advari guarantee. For a limited time only, treat yourself to one of our unique jewelry sets, including jewelry carved from the bones of our enemies, jewelry smelted in the fiery hot depths of Mount Doom, and our best seller, our jewelry set which you can own for nine easy payments delivered personally to our dwarven smiths for nine consecutive nights then it's yours to take home. So don't delay. You deserve to feel beautiful. More importantly, your man deserves for you to be beautiful. Come to Advaris today. We are not held responsible for the possible sexual nature of any nighttime interactions with dwarves. We take a strict what happens in Mount Doom stays in Mount Doom policy. All signatures considered binding for life. Any curses that may or may not devastate you or your kin are not the responsibility of Advaris Jewelry Parlor. Advaris reserves the right to extract payment in any way it deems suitable following the successful drawing of a binding contract. Welcome back to the Norse Files. Now we're going to take a look at women in Germanic mythology with our expert, Dr. Tanner. In many of the old myths, women took action, whereby themselves or through the manipulation of a man, in order to change the outcome of events or simply to get revenge. It is thereby, with their wit and intelligence, that most of these women acted. If for whatever reason, a woman in a saga was not bound to a man by blood or by marriage. She often donned her armor and took to the battlefield alongside men. One, of, one example of this comes from the Volsung saga, where the reader hears of a woman named Brynhild, who vowed to marry no man who knew fear, but only after Odin cursed her to have to marry did she have to marry. Brynhild was an independent woman who was not tied to any man for a long time and was actually warring alongside some of the best men for a great deal of time. It was only after she enraged Odin by killing someone he wished to have victory that he cursed her to never fight again, saying that she must settle down and marry a man. As previously stated, she then vowed to Odin that she would not marry any man who knew fear. Eventually, Sigurd comes along and woos her with his great courage and fearlessness. When something goes awry and Brynhild is tricked into marrying another man, she grows vengeful and deceives her husband, goading him to kill Sigurd for her. This tale is a wonderful example of the role women played when they were married to or living with a man versus when they were an only child or were off on their own. Another character in this tale portrays the life of a woman, portrays the life a woman was expected to live with her family. Gudrun, the woman Sigurd marries, is the model housewife for the Viking era. She stayed at home with her family, listened to her mother and brothers, and helped with the housework like entertaining guests. After Sigurd is given a potion of forgetfulness to make him forget Brynhild, Gudrun's mother tells her to fill Sigurd's cup for the rest of the night. She obeys her mother without any question. 
Sigurd also shows no displeasure with Gudrun when they are married until he remembers his love for Brynhild. It is true that Gudrun tells Brynhild Sigurd's secret, but she does not know the impact it would have, nor the outcome that would be produced by it. Later, Gudrun goads her second husband into seeking revenge against Brynhild and her husband for killing Sigurd. Gudrun proves herself to be a good wife, as many would desire, only resorting to manipulation if revenge for revenge of her husband's death, while Brynhild proves herself to be more independent, only manipulating a man once she is tied to him. And she has a desired goal he can attain for her. In the work Cold Council, Women in Old Norse Literature and Mythology, the author claims, it seems that goading others to violence and revenge is what women in the sagas do. It would appear that whenever a woman has ties to a man, this holds true. When she's not tied down, however, she is free to don her armor and to take whatever actions a man would. Live at Hlidergard for one night only, the Senna battles. Come feel the burns that have rocked a nation. There's not enough aloe vera in all the nine worlds for what's about to happen to your body. Guest speakers include Loki Odinson, Sinfiotli the Bastard Sigmundson, and Dave, straight from his mother's basement in Vancouver. Your mama's so fat, she gave piggyback rides to Ymir. Yeah, well, your mama's so big that her skull formed the sky. Your man's so small, he make a dwarf look big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, your jewelry's so tacky, I bet you only had to sleep with one dwarf. See all this and more sick burns right here, one night only, in Hlidergard. Be there, or be square. Welcome back to the Norse Files. We've had a look at women in Germanic mythology, but now let's take a look at what real Norse women were like with our expert, Dr. Michaels. So far, we've seen the stereotypes of women in Norse mythology. There's controversy within the myths of what the proper Norse woman really was, a warrior or a housewife. We also have mythical characters that are lustful objects, such as Freya, who is representative of love, sexuality, beauty, and fertility in the Norse myths. But we also have some that depict women in a fairly masculine way. A perfect example of this is Skadi, the daughter of the giant Thiazi, who appears in Snorri Sturluson's prose Edda in the marriage of Nor in the marriage of Njord and Skadi. In this myth, Thiazi has just been killed by the Aesir god, uh, and Skadi, the good daughter she is, sets out to avenge her father's death. In doing so, the Aesir offer her a husband to compensate the loss of her father, and Skadi and Njord are married. However, this is not a very daughterly task based on what we heard earlier of the lives of women as represented in the myths. Scotty was an adventurer and a warrior who traveled long distances, a manly feature in itself, in order to avenge her father in even more masculine activity. Perhaps the most notably non-feminine part of the story is the Aesir's offering of a sexual partner for Scotty, since a female partner was usually provided for male guests. Luckily, our experts recently found a cow licking an ice cube in the middle of a Norwegian field, and inside there was a real Norse woman. She's been frozen since the year 350 AD, meaning she's able to give us a full and accurate account of life was like in the Norse times. So, our Katla. <laughs> I see you're wearing many animal skins. Did your husband kill these animals and bring them home for you to make into clothes? What? No. I killed these animals with my bare hands. But was that frowned upon? Did the women at the Viking ship club gossip about you? Not at all. Gossip was a very dishonorable activity in my time. Plus, I owned the Viking ship club. So it would be very unwise to speak ill of me there. Plus, I didn't spend very much time at home. I wouldn't have heard any of it even if they did. What do you mean? You spent a lot of time attending to your parents? Who do you think I am? I'm an adventurer. Well, that seems an odd profession for a woman. Uh, there's only one notable depiction of a masculine woman in the Norse myths. Weren't all the women sexualized stay-at-home mothers who were married by their fathers? Far from it. Women were considered to be just as capable as men in all activities. Like I said, I was an explorer. I raided and pillaged, leaving towns burned to the ground. Yes, 
I was a great and renowned warrior. Well, how did you come across your property? And how did you find yourself in that profession? I was the only child in my family. I admit, men usually were the ones to adventure. But because I was an only child, it was my duty to carry on the family name. When my noble parents finally got their place in Valhalla, I, being unmarried, was left with all their belongings. In order to keep my family name, I went on a quest to fight as many battles as I could, kill as many men as I was strong enough to kill, and make my name known for years to come by dying a noble death in battle. Not every woman chose to live that life, though. There were women who stayed at home. However, this d doesn't mean that they were overly s sexualized. However, Women's role in the home was just as important as their husband's roles. Sure, a man might go kill an animal, but the woman was responsible for cleaning the skin and making clothes, as well as preparing the meal from the meat and make the weapons from the bones. And even married women were allowed, both socially and legally, to own property, hold government office, and do everything else that men did. But what about the slaves? We know from archeological and written saga history that women were kept as slaves, how can you explain that if women are equal to men? This is true. Women were slaves. But Norse women were never enslaved. Being a traveler, I had many slaves of my own. All female, of course. But they were not my slaves because of their gender. I am a woman, too. They were enslaved because they were strangers, not from the same village or the same noble bloodline. So their lives were not as important as mine. Thank you very much for your time and for clearing up our misconceptions of Norse women. Women in Norse society weren't considered lesser humans, but equals, free to do as they pleased, especially if they were only children with a legacy to carry on. Otto's new full fashion lineup is here. Don't be a square, be a bear. Our custom tailored bear, wolf and fox pelts will let you access the beast inside of you. Unleash your rage on your co-workers, friends and family. Take what's yours with fire and blood. 90% of people who don't shop at Otto's run the risk of freezing to death in our increasingly harsh winter climate. It's not only a fashion statement, it doubles as a house. Don't be a flake, be a snake. Who could forget our accents and accessories? Have you ever wanted to wear a snake? At Otters, we can make your fashion dreams come true. Our stylish selection has something for everyone. Belts, purses and scarves. Don't be a beagle, be an eagle. Shop at Otters for all your clothing needs. Welcome back to the Norse Files. We hope that you've been enjoying the program. Now we'll take a leap into the future and look at the effects of media on young girls today. Our modern media, despite progress for gender equality, still portrays women in primarily homemaker type roles. Magazines geared toward women discuss mainly domestic issues. Movies teach us how women should behave in the workplace. Video games sexualize women's bodies. Women are constantly regarded as lesser than men. 20 years ago, I interviewed a young girl and followed up with her every 10 years to see how the modern media's depiction of women has affected her life. I first met Anna when she was at Disney World with her parents. Hi Anna, how are you doing today? Good, I'm really excited to be here at Disney World. Do you enjoy watching Disney movies, Anna? Of course! How old are you, Anna? I'm 10. What lessons have you learned from watching Disney movies, Anna? Tons of lessons. I've learned that boys are supposed to be strong and brave and protect their girls. And it's okay for girls to be weak um, and afraid because the boys will always come to protect them. And I've also learned that girls are always nicer and they cry more. So can girls be strong and brave too? I guess they can. Some of them, like Mulan, are definitely brave. But my favorite is Cinderella. She makes pretty dresses and cleans the house and marries a prince. As you can see, Anna was able to pick up on a variety of traits from watching Disney movies as a child. I caught up with Anna again as she was attending the University of Kentucky. Let's see what her plans were then. Nice to see you again, Anna. You can too, you, Dr. Hall. Can you catch us up on what you've been up to these past few years? Uh, sure. Um, well now, I'm 20. I'm a sophomore here at UK, and I'm studying psychology. Um, I've been dating the same guy since freshman year. His name's Nick. So. so tell me, Anna, how often do you consume media? 
Like Facebook? No, not really. More like TV, movies, magazines. Hmm. Oh, okay. Well, I watch Netflix all the time. Um, so a ton of movies and TV. Some of my friends and I look through magazines, um, mostly for fashion and stuff. And Nick plays a bunch of video games, but I don't really play. Okay, Anna. Have you noticed what most of the female characters in Nick's video games wear? Uh, yeah. They kind of don't wear a lot. And what kind of articles do you find in your magazines? Uh, mostly fashion and makeup and a lot of, like, how to get your guy to like you. Um, every once in a while, there'll be something about travel or jobs. How many movies do you watch that are about women and their careers? Well, not very many. Most of them are more chick flicks. Uh, you know, guy and a girl, they fall in love and get married. Most of the girls have jobs, but they're not that important. Uh, the ones that are mostly about jobs and stuff like that are like Miss Congeniality and Legally Blonde. And how do you think women are portrayed in those films? I don't know. Sometimes really girly, like in Legally Blonde. But uh, Juliana Roberts is like really gross in Miss Congeniality until, you know, they dress her up. And Meryl Steps is really mean in The Devil Wears Prada. Anna has laid out many of the problems with our modern media and has bought into a lot of the propaganda. When I asked her why she wasn't studying something like chemical engineering, she told me that that was only for guys, that her girlfriends would make fun of her. She told me, all she really wanted was to just be a good wife and mom, which is exactly what the media says she should be. Nice to see you again, Anna. How have you been these last few years? I've been okay. I married the guy, Nick. Um, he left me about seven years ago. I was pregnant then, and I've had a hard time finding a job. And he still sends me child support sometimes, but sorry to hear that. So why do you think you're having a hard time now? Well, lots of reasons. I think I bought into the idea of the perfect 50s family and uh, that just hadn't worked for me. Um, maybe it does for some people, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I should have gone to medical school like I wanted. I, uh, I got married and was planning the perfect wedding and got busy doing that stuff. And uh, Plus, I don't think people would take me seriously in a job anyway. Uh, everything I've ever read or seen puts such a huge emphasis on the woman being pretty, loving, and getting married. and taking care of their families, I never really thought much about doing anything else with my life. Now I'm wishing I had. I've spent a lot more time worried about getting a good job and being independent than, you know, I have. I wouldn't be here. I am crazy, Gimli, and everything in our inventory has to go. Go, go. Crafts. Find dwarves and crafts. Straight from Orzammar, we have swords, we have shields, we have more swords. Fine quality craftsmanship found only here at Gimli's Sword Emporium. Just as this token head. Mimir? It's green! Thanks, Mimir. You heard it. Straight from Avenir. We have the best swords around. And look at these prices. I'm crazy for setting this low. Everything knows for... Oh. <clears throat> Everyone knows foreign swords are the best swords. Accept no substitutes. Buy a long swords today and get a token head free. Oi! Quit Mimir or I will decapitate you again. Gimli's Sword Emporium. Tell them Gimli sent you. Welcome back. Well... 
So far, we've looked back into the past and gotten a bit of a feel for the differences between women in Norse tales and actual Norse women, thanks in part to the lovely Aunt Katla, who will now be refrozen and put on display in a museum right here in Brumen Daltenberg. I think we can all agree that letting her continue on in a society that is completely new and foreign to her might be detrimental to her health. Speaking of culture shock, we're now going to turn our critical eyes away from the portrayal of women in Norse media to the portrayal of women in our own media. What has changed? Why? And what do these changes reflect about our own society? Actress Whoopi Goldberg once made an astute comment about the types of roles available to women. The year was 1996. She listed among her roles for women mothers, wives, and prostitutes. While said in jest, she made an interesting point, considering that all awards received by women that year were for roles that fit these categories. A majority were prostitutes. As we have seen, these are perhaps roles that have been around since Gudrun and Brynhilde. Can you think of characters in popular films that fit these roles? Are these stereotypes that are familiar to you? Do they conjure a specific image, a specific character from a popular movie, book, or comic? For the purpose of telling a story, it can be useful to rely on archetypes. It lets the audience know what to expect and perhaps tell something about a character without it needing to be said directly. However, as Dr. Hall showed us in our last segment, we must consider what this persisting stereotype says about our society. Still, though those stereotypes are familiar to us, that award ceremony was 18 years ago. We have another, currently very popular role to consider, one that can also be found in old Norse texts, the warrior woman. In her book, Spectacular Bodies, Gender, Genre, and the Action Cinema, Yvonne Tasker cites some famous action heroines, but claims that they are in fact more tailored to the male gaze than to the fe female. They themselves are a stereotype, but no less fulfilling to a female viewer than the girl next door, the prostitute, or the mother. They have a particular role to fill, she claims, and therefore come across no less two-dimensional than their fellow stereotypes. With that in mind, one must wonder how much things have truly changed. Yet surely the action heroine is a step forward from other roles, mainly ones defined by the masculine influence on the story, if not the completely. Her rising popularity must be in response to a shift in society, one where women are more empowered, Yet these images are not only a reflection of our culture. For females raised in a society saturated with media, it is impossible not to be influenced in turn by said media. At times, even I must admit that I feel I am nothing more than a character, invented to serve a singular purpose and then to fade away into obscurity, as if I possess no real depth at all. But putting aside my own personal existential crisis, we'll see you next time on The Norse Files, when we'll take a closer look at the social implications of Thor's beard colour.